It's Bigfoot Collectors Club with Bryce and Michael. <laughs> I know a ghost story or two. Let's do this. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome back to a brand new episode. Can you welcome someone back to a brand new episode? That makes no sense. But hey, sure. guys, it's a new episode of Bigfoot Collectors Club. I'm your host, Michael McMillan. Uh, with me always is your other host, Bryce Johnson, and our super producer, Riley Bragg. And I forgot to mention this is a show where we talk to amazing guests about their personal paranormal history and share stories of high strangeness. There it is. You know, my brain <laughs> is oh, uh, That makes two of us, man toast um guys i don't want to waste a minute of this episode because holy shit yeah do we have i mean listen we've had some good guests but this lady is a genuine movie star she <laughs> should not be on this podcast. what are you doing here <laughs> uh she's an amazing actress she's a uh she's a star of the stage she's a star of the silver screen the small screen your iphone screen ladies and gentlemen boys and girls uh, you know her from FX Hulu's Devs, one of my favorite shows of this entire uh, year. Same. And uh, you can see her in the brand new Star Trek series, Picard. Wow. Guys, give a warm Club Scout welcome to Allison Pill. Yay! Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for boy. being here. We really, uh, we really lucked out on this one. Allison. Um, yes. Thank sure. you for being here. That's all I was saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Wonderful now, are you, do you do do you listen to a lot of podcasts? Do you guess on a lot of podcasts? Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, a pretty much a constant guest on podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, I um, I do enjoy a podcast, so it's um, it's one of my. I, I think it's I think it's one of my favorite media mediums. Really? Yeah, I do. Um, and I, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't until I moved to LA that I fully appreciated it because it can really make those drives possible. Yeah. You got to make your car into like a little sanctuary. I learned that when I moved out to LA and first and something was- like calming, like there's, um, you know, there's some, and there's some great science podcasts like the BBC, really dry, really great. You're stuff. so you're a nerd. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> fantastic. What are your favorite <laughs> science podcasts? Well, there's the one. Um, I mean, Science Versus is nice, but it's a little more poppy than um, what's. Oh yeah, Inside Science. Uh, as we all that? stare blankly at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do science on this show. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say uh, we got shit on uh, a recent episode for for calling Neil deGrasse Tyson a buzzkill, and now everyone thinks we're really anti science. And I guess the subject matter that we're into doesn't help that it reputation comes with either. The territory. But- yeah, I mean that's just, but I figure that's why I was invited. The other thing that I love is it, um, the Melvin Bragg podcast. Again, very dry. I was going to say, with a name like Melvin Bragg, it doesn't sound like you're recommending, like, pancake joints. (laughs) (laughs) No, but he did write a book called The Adventure of English. That's how I discovered him. And it is an adventure! (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Okay, well, we're so happy you're here. Uh, Hopefully this will live up to your podcast expectations. I'm going to say right now, I doubt it. But... uh, (laughs) Allison, we like to ask all of our guests, and you kind of gave us a little tip off here. What is your personal paranormal history? Do you have any spooky stories? Do you have any spooky thoughts, beliefs, anything that can fall under the realm of the unexplained or the supernatural? Um, I mean, quantum mechanics is spooky enough for me. Here to be we go with you. Yeah, like spooky it's action really. In Exactly. How how does time mean nothing over distance? I mean, how can how can there be no delay? I mean, we know the speed of light is pretty effing quick. So how can two seemingly related, like just related particles, act at the same time across light years of distance? 
what is it that allows them to communicate? Is it communicate? They're part of their, is it communication? They're particles. You know, they're, they're, they're not. Mm. Don't even get me started on viruses. They're not even alive. Let's talk <laughs> viruses. Why not? <laughs> No, that's a bad area. Scary. That's a supernatural <laughs> unseen force that we're all dealing with right now. I mean, it, yeah. it really is in a lot of ways. I mean, it, before people knew what they were, they were just a, a, a spirit of magic or, you know, it was like who, who knew what this was. And now even that we do sort of know what they are, they're almost more baffling. It's like yeah, I mean, it's, just, it's true. It's like bad humors is sort of the same. You're like, yeah, that's kind of exactly still what we think of it, where we're just like, yes, there's something ethereal that may come and approach you. Yeah. Bad Humor is also the name of Melvin Bragg's punk band. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in- obviously you got into a lot of like quantum mechanics and stuff on devs, which again, yeah. boy, I love that show. That was such a fucking great series. All a- Everyone who's listening to this show, if you have not watched devs, if you can watch it, you got to absolutely check it out. Um, so did you learn, did you do a lot of research in quantum theory and quantum mechanics for that show? I mean, listen, it's like, uh, I read, I read some books, you know, but I'm, I'm not a, a quantum physicist now. You're not. Okay. I no, thought it took one just to book. Be clear. <laughs> just to be clear. Um, there are really great, uh, I highly recommend Richard Feynman's lectures, which are all available on YouTube. He's a really famous physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project and then became like one of the greatest science teachers of his time. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, no, I, I had some interest in quantum mechanics, but um, but this really allowed, like when I was in high school, I read a book on it and I was like, I want to be a quantum physicist. But then you had to be better at math. Yeah, that map gets in the way, and you're like, okay. Yeah. Okay, well. Going on TV instead, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember in high school, I was taking chemistry, and I, I had already completed all my science credits, but I just was like, I'll do chemistry. And I remember halfway through the year, I was like, I, just, I don't need to be doing this. I'm just going to quit. <laughs> like, I was just like, I, 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 caught, I caught the basics and then I just had to add too many letters and numbers and I was just so confused. I love chemistry. Man, chemistry is cool. I think it's unfortunate that math gets in the way of some of our great thinkers, you know, maybe, maybe have- <laughs> like Bryce Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. I mean, maybe we'd have some more uh, innovation and some more, uh, you know, great inventions. If, if Don, it if it math. just, if it wasn't for math, I'm telling you, I'd be one of the greatest thinkers in this country. <laughs> uh, but I also think teaching math as a language could be really helpful. Cause I forget, like I'm actually like, I, I did music enough as a kid and, and I never understood how they related. You know, they're like, Mozart was a genius at math and music yeah. is related. And I'm like, how? How well, on then, earth? And then there's always that, you know, God, you look into nature and you see so many geometrical patterns that it's hard not to think that, you know, there's a, there is a mathematical language that exists in nature. And, 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 if, that, and if that's the case, and there's ultimately a designer, you know, so... I think so. It brings into some great questions about, you know, just what's this reality we're living in? Well, Fibonacci sequence, I mean, like we were just, I was with my daughter. We were just looking at some, we were just making some salt dough dinosaur fossils, Mm. as you do. Yes. And um, they were, we watched a video and they were talking about ammonites, which are Mm. just like physical representations of a Fibonacci sequence. Yeah. Yeah. So you're just like, what? The, the cockle shell, I mean, uh, spiral galaxies, and it's yeah. everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. It's just, uh, yeah, there's some great videos on YouTube that have. Uh, to for do those with of us who can't sequence. totally remember the Fibonacci sequence, that's like when you recognize that spiral. Is it specifically yeah. the spiral pattern that occurs in different places in nature? What What is yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's how nature expands. It's, it's, it's the growing pattern of every sort of organic thing. And, and just uh, you can find it in nature, you can find it in animals, you can find yeah. it in the universe. And, uh, I, I don't know. I forget the mathematics, but it's like one plus two equals three, and then the and then the two plus three equals five, it's, and then the last two numbers constantly adi- adding to themselves, and and it creates this growth pattern, which can be formatted out into a into a spiral. <laughs> Was, see, you I like it. that you made the windmill motion with your hand as you're explaining it to us. 
Oh man. But it is pretty spooky. I mean, it's like, that's, that's pretty amazing stuff. Or it's just, we found the right language to describe the world. Perhaps. I tend to think it's more that, that we're, we're, yeah, like math is this language we're figuring out to describe reality rather than it's the foundation of reality but we're, I don't pro- know. we're projecting onto, uh, onto yeah. the universe it, yeah but then i think a lot of people completely disagree with that and they don't think it's a human construct it's it's us discovering a construct that exists so i don't know mm-hmm. what to say no chicken and egg yeah it's a definite chicken and egg situation so allison you've definitely had a i'd say heavy sci-fi year so far in your mm-hmm. work um, I have not watched Picard yet because I don't have CBS All Access. But, um, Wait, but Michael, you missed. What do you mean you missed it? It was a free for a month, you goose. Oh shit! Really? I'll get it. I'll just subscribe so I can watch. No, you don't have to. Just wait till. Se- I mean, don't don't listen to me. I was just gonna say wait till oh. season two is nearby. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> uh, but so I I just wonder how much time do you spend with your imagination wondering about uh, life on other planets, uh, whether or not we've been visited. What do you think about all that stuff? Um, I I don't think we have been visited. I think the um, I think the chance of life on other planets is exceedingly good. Intelligent um, life? Uh, possibly. Mm. Um. Uh. I mean, I think, like, as we learn more about the frozen water on planets closest to us, you know, that we, we, and then, and then just, I mean, even trying to comprehend what an alien being, what an intelligence, an other, an other intelligence would be is, it it, it just, it's like trying to imagine a tesseract. Mm -hmm. You're just like, I don't know what that dimension means in my brain. (laughs) <laughs> but it's because <laughs> yeah, yeah. like those people yeah. like they might be like four dim- fourth dimensional creatures and we would just be like i don't even know like you you know it would be like looking at a pencil and thinking that a pencil is just a straight line bridge it's just like a 2d object because you're only seeing the horizon line on it you're not seeing that it's made up of this little all these little angles and is actually almost you know like all of, Allison, all of the you are speaking our language right now. We're yeah, with, with you. We're 100%. right here with you. Yeah. This is this is the shit we like to talk about. Yeah. Because <laughs> no, there's theories. That... There's theories that like even UFOs, right? That people see. You know, if they're seen as an individual flying saucer, let's say that might just be exactly what you're describing. That it might not even be from another planet, but another dimension. And what we see as a flying saucer is actually that 2D horizon line that's really part of a larger system or entity of some kind from another dimension. That's just the way it manifests here in the third dimension as a flying saucer or something that looks like a spaceship, but it might be, you know, us looking at the fingernail of some right. larger consciousness, you know, and not recognize mm-hmm. and thinking that's the whole thing. And that it's blipping through into our current universe from somewhere else. Exactly. You know, but there there are a lot. I mean, that's the thing too. Is a lot of these sort of contact reports, and believe me, there's a plethora of them. I mean, they often describe sort of the typical uh, anthropomorphic shape. You know, two yeah. arms, two legs, a head, strange eyes, large head, no mouth. Uh, but you know, there it is in its form. So um, either way, we're sort of receiving this thing as a as an anthropomorphic uh supernatural entity whether it is or not who knows but uh, at least that's how we perceive a lot of it i was so fascinated i mean i'm i'm a big uh like i'm a huge fan of alex garland's work and i think annihilation was one of the better representations of a possible alien being mm. and i know it's not his original work the book is also fantastic but the book is so good that everything yeah. i couldn't agree more i love all of that and it's just and just trying to imagine what the like what that intelligence is and what that intelligence is doing is just i think far more likely than anything we've seen on screen before and also has some pretty like Martha Graham level like dance modern dance skills too <laughs> and Sonoya, Sonoya, who is the lead in devs is that person is the 
No he's way. He's an alien. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. That's he awesome. He's a silver being. That's Samoya. That scene in Annihilation is one of the coolest, like, alien contact sequences I think I've seen in any any movie. Alex Garland is like on fire, dude. That guy's been around forever too. I mean, he's like been, you know, he's he wrote Twenty Eight Days Later. He wrote The Beach, yeah. like in this guy. He also like- basically directed Dread. Oh mm-hmm. right, I've heard that as well, which I haven't, oh. I haven't actually seen Dread. This guy's fantastic. Um, it's awesome. Hey guys, I hear my ice cream truck outside. You want me to grab you anything? <laughs> Choco Taco, anybody? Oh, Choco Taco's all around. <laughs> Choco Taco's for everybody. Stand I want by. one of those Mickey Mouse pops with the uh, gu- um, uh, gumball eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you were that kid that had got the gumball ice cream. <laughs> Oh, man, I loved bubblegum ice cream. We would always go to 31 Flavors after eating at Mario's Italian Restaurant in Kansas, where I grew up. And I would always get the bubblegum ice cream, and it would always fall off my cone. And I'd always remember sitting in the backseat of the car and just, like, picking up the ice cream and putting it back on the cone. And there just being, like, a big, just, like, handprint on there and then, like, lint from the car floor. And then I would, well, you're that I, would kid. I would swallow <laughs> all of that bubble gum. I would chew oh, it. That's, just, see, that's, I was never bit. allowed bubble gum flavor. I wished, I wished with all of my heart that after our little league games, my parents would finally allow me to get the bright pink bubble gum ice oh, cream. Man. And every time they were like, you're going to choke. Oh no, <laughs> it's vanilla for you, Allison. Hard, yeah, soft, <laughs> quick, <laughs> fast melting vanilla for you, Allison. <laughs> and to be honest with you, they weren't wrong. <laughs> yeah, vanilla is good. What what, it, what thing? What item does your child want that you're like you're gonna choke? You're, like what is the, what is the bubblegum ice cream of your child's life now that they will resent um, you for forever? I mean, she's pretty. Uh, I don't know. All I can think about is the fact that we made frozen bananas dipped in chocolate and sprinkled with almonds today, and I'm really excited about that. Is an that accomplishment. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're going to be delicious. Um, but in terms of things that she is not allowed because of choking, she's a, she's a pretty smart lady. Um, I don't really, I don't really worry that much. She's raising herself at this point. She's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's fine. <laughs> she's, she's really. An am- so she's like, she cooks for herself. She cleans, you know, she's building a quantum computer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, but I, I think like going back to the alien stuff, I, I don't know. Doing the, now this show for two and a half years, my mind just spirals in and out of possibilities of like I've gone from, okay, they are definitely from another planet because I feel like, you know, obviously if, a, if, a, if, if there is, there are obviously huge uh, hurdles of intergalactic uh, travel that you have to overcome just to be able to get from point A to point B. But I feel like if a, if a civilization has a million years on us, they're no going to solve, they've solved those problems already. You know, they solved it before we were in the stone age. Yeah. And, and so, but then I think I'm, you know, we've been lately more and more getting into the idea of this all being phenomena from parallel dimensions. So I, I just don't know. And sometimes I wonder if it's just easier just to not believe in any of this stuff. I don't know. But uh, it always seems to be an exercise in, of, the, uh, of the imagination regardless. Yeah, I, I mean, love do you guys that. believe in God? That was actually why I wanted to come around and talk to you since you mentioned the designer. But uh, I, I, don't, I, I believe in some sort of creative force, I would say. Yeah. Mm. What, what yeah. about you guys? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and, and it's a great parlay into what I'll be talking about later for my story of high strangeness. But, yeah, I do believe that... Uh, that that ice cream truck is really spooky. It's such a good <laughs> score to this conversation. It's hilarious. It's gotten really <laughs> ominous. That's amazing. Yeah, I do, be- I do believe in, in, in something. Now, what it is, I'm not sure. And, uh, but, yeah, I, I think there is some supernatural agency that uh, has influence over our lives. Now, whether you call that God or... Uh, um, I don't know the conscious universe or, or I, I don't know, but yeah, there, there does seem to be something. Yeah. I'm almost what? more inclined to believe in this, in simulation theory than like, mm-hmm. a God. like, right. I, but, but I, who I, wrote that simulation theory? I know, and, and then, then, and then you who, crea- who created that thought. person that wrote that simulation theory? Like, right. So that's the thing. It just goes on forever and ever. Like if there's a God who made God, like, yeah. I don't know. I, I I really struggle with that when I flip flop on it all the time because I definitely see 
a divinity in nature that's like undeniable. I mean, it's 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 on it's beautiful. It's perfect, but like uh, I don't know, big like I can't the like personified god creature. I have a really hard time wrapping my head around. Well, it's just a Zeus ripoff, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Allison, were you raised religious growing up? Where are you uh, from? I'm from Toronto. Um, I was not. Uh, I was not raised particularly religious. Um, we went to church based on its Estonianism rather than its Lutheranism, really. <laughs> Mm. Um, my dad's from Estonia. And so we were trying to, I think in the decision as it went down was sort of like, either the kids are going to go to Estonian language school or we can go to Estonian Lutheran church. And it just seemed easier to do. Let's do it once a week instead of five days a week. (laughs) Yeah. Like let's just, um, uh, and, and it's, I recently joined a church like, like a year ago I started going, um, and uh, I'm sure partly based on thoughts about determinism and free will and science and quantum mechanics and thinking about the universe and um, uh, reading David Foster Wallace's book on infinity and just going like, what is infinity? What is infinity? Yeah. It's impossible. It's impossible. It hurts your mind. But if it isn't impossible, then infinity is God. Like, is, like, is that God? Mm. like like is infinity god like if the possi- if the possibility exists for infinity because we cannot do math on infinity we can basically say like near infinity well you know and I, I, it- I, oh i was gonna say i've always loved the i the idea of infinity and and <laughs> i've tried to uh uh explain what it is on this show a few times but the one i liked that where i got close to it <laughs> i forgot about that old song about yeah. that. bring that back <laughs> but uh you know so in sort of esoteric philosophy a lot of people thought that the uh the pyramids for example the great pyramids of egypt uh, a lot of people don't know that uh when they were actually built they left the capstone off because the capstone to them represented the infinite so for instance if you take the capstone of the pyramid that which is the ice top, cream truck <laughs> yeah, no, <I'm> really <laughs> you are, i could shut the window or do you guys no, like it i don't, I don't know, know. Just, i just love that you're talking about the pyramids <laughs> and there's just uh, is this guy doing like loops around your block <laughs> <laughs> is he parked uh, right out front I, it seemed like he was for a second but uh, he seems to be moving on uh but they would leave the capstone of the pyramid off I, that because... ice cream truck by the way is for sure the fbi spying on you he does look a little strange uh but the, but the idea that the capstone represented infinity because that capstone would in itself have a capstone Right. And then the capstone of that capstone would have a capstone. And so to them, that rap- represented the infinite. They could never actually complete a capstone because each smaller pyramid on top of that pyramid also would have a capstone, you know, going into infinity. That, that, that infinitesimal small point um, where things are actually created. But I always thought that was an interesting way to look at it. That was a really good. You should have done that for our old segment. You just, I think, nailed it. Bryce describes infinity. There you go. You nailed it. Um, <clears throat> Allison, oh, you talk about determinism, and I know that comes up a lot in uh, uh, devs. Can you t- talk to us a little bit about what that theory of determinism is? Sure, yeah. Um, it is basically saying that um, from the the inception of the universe like at the big bang in the point zero 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 one seconds after the explosion from that point on um everything can be determined so that there's no such thing as free will that the universe is unfolding um like a set story um that the, the things we assume to be free will are all predicated on something else happening to um, to to propel that action. Sort of cause so, and effect. Yes. Even down to the next words coming out of your mouth. Yes. Exactly. And there's the thought experiment of that playing out. There's a great Ted Chiang short story in Exhalations about the free will machine that is you it's just a simple machine that has a button that lights up 
every time before you press it. Like each and every person who tries to uh, press it before the light goes on, well, the light, it doesn't matter how long you wait, how quickly you press it, it's always going to light up before you press it because everything is predetermined. Mm. And That's it sort of cool. crushes a lot of human minds. <laughs> <laughs> So do you believe in determinism now? I mean, like what, what uh, I, I feel like the show is very, it's all built on that theory. I mean, obviously. Um, so I just wonder like how that's affected the way you think about, about reality. I think it's incredibly likely. Um, but the important thing that uh, can get lost in discussions about it is that it's not that nothing matters. You know, it doesn't, I don't think it invites nihilism in the way some other things do, because it's not that nothing matters. It's that everything was always going to happen Mm. the way it happens. That doesn't preclude you feeling love. Like it doesn't take away the reality of love. If love is, if we just go with the idea that love is simply chemistry in our brains reacting to other, others' chemistry, it doesn't take away its reality. It actually sort of sets it in the body and makes it more real to me. Um, so it's not that nothing matters. I think the goodness of people uh, is still important. Um, but it does invite some real moral conundrums in that if you do something bad and you are always going to do it, how can you be punished? Mm-hmm. Like, how can you, um, if somebody murders somebody else and they were always going to do it, what, what do you, I mean, do you, prisons stop making as much sense? Right. I mean, I have to believe that within every closed system, there's the opportunity for chaos and spontaneity. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, that there's always a chance for some unknown agency or unknown factor to insert itself into a given situation. And I, you know, I, I think this is what makes life fresh and gives it zeal. And this is what, uh, you know, raises the hair on our forearms when, when, when something happens. I think, I think, uh, I think this is what society so often struggles with, right? Is like, you know, what sort of free will do I have over the decisions I make? Can I direct my life towards something it was not headed to in the first place? Yeah. I would also say, I, I would also say, sorry, I would uh, just that the, um, um, I totally lost it. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I your words. No, no, that was me. No, I was. Guys, uh, determinism. It's neither of your fault. Always <laughs> happens. <laughs> that was meant to happen ever since the Big Bang. Oh right? yeah, this is what I was going to say. I was just going to say that I think um, humans are, human brains want to believe in God and want to believe in free will. And I think there's little use in efforts to deny those things. Like, I, I just don't see whether you say God is a higher power, a creative force or whatever. I mean, if, if you are successful at doing that, since some hyper logical people are, I think for the most part, I think 99.9 whatever percent of us, uh, we have brains that are like we've seen through evolution. Like, I don't know what the evolutionary purpose is. That's an interesting question to me, but you know, the, like shutting people up with the masks and the thing, like how many people hear God on those? Oh, like, you're talking about the God helmet kind yeah. of, yeah, or, or the, um, the, uh, Estes method too, uh, that they did in, uh, Hellier, which is a documentary series that we're into. You're talking about blindfolding people and, and putting yeah. sound out like sensory deprivation. Yes. And how many people hear God? Like, I just think our, our brains want it so much and our brains want free will so much and are so good at denying. I mean, basically what it, the conclusion I came to after devs is it, um, there's a, there's a, there's a chance, there's a logical, there's a logical reason for me to believe that, but that is never going to be enough for me to actually believe it. Right. <laughs> because I'm still going to perform my, my day to day life as though I have free will. Right. Because what else could you do? Yeah. Yeah. I thought the thing, the thing with devs and, and how it resolved it that I like loved so much was the introduction of the multiverse into that whole predictive algorithm. Because then, then predeterminism makes perfect sense to me. Because if, if everything happens and has happened, then I, my, then fine, sure, this is predetermined. And there's infinite versions of me that are predetermined on other paths. 
And that to me, I'm like, okay, yeah, that checks out. I can, I can live with that. Yeah, you should definitely, I mean, the most amazing, uh, he's a philosopher of science and his stuff is the best stuff that I found. David Wallace, he wrote a book called The Emergent Multiverse and his stuff, it is highly technical, but he's also a really, um, like his academic writings are one thing, but his lectures are really great. I find him really charming. Cool. Um, he's kind of my quantum physicist crush. Sorry about it. We all knows. have one, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I like video games. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I could. Yeah, I was going to say. Don't under, my, my brain doesn't. You don't like, seem like I, a PS4 person, <laughs> Allison. <laughs> just needs I the right game somebody, to come along. I, I just really, I, it honestly doesn't make sense to my vision is the problem. <laughs> well, yeah, that's like, a problem then. <laughs> I'm too smart. My vision needs books. Just put some books <laughs> in my vision. Mean, I can handle that. I really don't mean that. I think in terms of long form narratives, I've heard amazing things about different games. Like I've read about games that I like. Right. <laughs> that's exactly. <laughs> you're like the way I I played The Last of Us was reading an article about it. <laughs> but, but I really like I just don't understand. I don't understand what are walls in a lot of the games. Like I'm like, I literally I'm like, what is a wall and what is the floor? It is. is- I'm, let me tell you, it is amazing to watch the attention it can hold over an eight year old. I mean, it, with, without ever having there be bored is bored, bored or just like, I mean, it can just consume the hours. It's, it's, it seems to be like endless entertainment. Um, it's pretty fascinating. And I, I find myself playing a lot of my son's video games too. And just yeah, the, hours, <laughs> Give me the, hours, the hours pass by pretty quickly. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, my sister is. and I used to play Super Nintendo and Duck Hunt was my uh, favorite. You know. Nintendo, those Nintendo summers, I've been really thinking about them during quarantine a lot lately. I was yeah. like, part of me wishes like, it, we need to come up with a virtual reality scenario where you can put on the helmet and you're back in like 1991 and you go across the street to your friend's house and you sit in the basement and you just play like final <laughs> fantasy on the original nintendo like that's the I shit thought- i want to get to i want to be able to like walk into a toys r us from like 1985 and then like look at all the toys i had as a kid i mean nostalgia i know people uh, have mixed feelings on it but i i want that kind of thing where you can basically time travel to points in your own lifetime i thought you were going to say getting out to nature in your vr set <laughs> no i want to go <laughs> no i i've just been like really wishing for all the, the, the old times yeah i want to go sit in a basement sit in a basement and then put it on your headset and be like now i'm going to take a walk through the woods <laughs> yeah i had the woods you know this though i grew up right next to the woods and that place terrified me <laughs> So I don't want to go out there. <laughs> Wait, were you in Kansas City? I was in, yeah, Kansas City, but I was in the suburbs. And where I grew up, the neighborhood, I, the town, the subdivision that I grew up uh, was kind of considered on the edge of town when we first, you know, moved there. Now it's all become suburban sprawl. But, you yeah. know, I, we were 20 minutes from downtown. But if you walked across the street, there was like cow pastures, you know. Right. So it it was like that it was sort of an idyllic kind of place to grow up because you had basically everything that you wanted access to um, with the exception of a lot of diversity. But um, yeah, so I, we grew up like, you know, there was a Creek running through my neighborhood and a pond and woods and, you know, that there was a lot of like great, I had a very stranger things upbringing, you know, being able to just like go out all day on your bicycle and then just come back when you hear your dad whistle. For dinner. Sounds nice. <laughs> All I got around here are Seven Elevens and ice cream trucks. So <laughs> not, not the same. Knocking down your door. <laughs> you haven't paid your taxes in seven yeah, years. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Allison, going back to something you said earlier, I think the thing that you, that I think about when you're talking about, like, you know, we want God, we want this, is I. It, to me, we want story, we want narrative. The human brain, to me, is just very eager to take it's just hungry for story and i don't know why that is you know it's part of this behind but this podcast you know you see it in things like conspiracy theory you know when when presented with something we don't understand or chaos 
the brain wants to, and now we see, you know, it happens on the internet, like collectively people get together and they come up with a narrative to explain the shit that's painful or that we don't understand or that's frustrating. So there's always like this drive to like, and then Hollywood obviously is just all story. Um, I just no, I dri- it, it drives everyone's life. What's the meaning of my life? You know, Jordan Peterson would say, uh, man is a is a meaning making machine. We try to make meaning out of everything we come across. What does it mean? What does it mean to my life? What does my life mean? You know, I think you're absolutely right. There's there's definitely something ingrained within our DNA that that strives for us to find the meaning. What is the purpose of us being here? Everybody struggles with that. Uh, it's something that that isn't t- unique to just any one individual. It it, it kind of it kind of ties us all together. We all share in that that bond to to find out why the fuck we're here. You know, what is the purpose behind all of this? And I think it builds, it's one of those, I just think about the evolutionary need of it. So certainly, yes, to make sense of the world enough to, you know, to sort of pass down to next generation's wisdom in real ways that you'll remember. Like, this is why we don't cross that river because of that bad demon you know whatever it is like like it's actually a demon called drowning but sure there's a demon you know like what's um, the difference (laughs) right totally honestly um but i i also it's a search for meaning and it's also just our brains are i mean looking at also at child development like our pattern recognition is crazy good like it's insane how how quickly babies learn what is a cat and how a cat is different than a dog even though cats are look a lot look can look very different they have different colors they're different shapes they have different hair lengths whatever it is you know that that you look at how you're, you're already you're trying to set everything up in this pattern of like same 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 different you know, like your whole, your whole, your, and so I see the evolutionary need in, in that too. And it also can build community where you're like, same, 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 great. And then you also see how it can cause division. Cause if you don't think same, same, then, yep. well, here we are. Did you hear Allison Pill on Bigfoot Collectors Club? She was really mother shaming me because my baby can't recognize a cat. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> all right well we're gonna go from highbrow to lowbrow with the game that we love to play with all of our guests i think this is gonna be Can't fascinating wait. uh this is rapid fire i'm gonna go down a list of phenomenon and allison if you're open to it you're gonna say believe it if you're not open to it you're gonna say bullshit there's no in between this is a game that we like to call bullshit or believe it allison pill on your mark get set ghosts uh bullshit ufos um believe it bigfoot bullshit little gray aliens bullshit out of body experiences Mm, like what's the definition okay believe it Mm. demonic possession uh bullshit the bermuda triangle bullshit alien abductions bullshit loch ness monster bullshit Time travel. It depends on what you mean. Um, believe it in a way. I mean, we don't time as a continuum, so sure, it's possible. Mothman. Believe it. Mothman. I don't, I'm not entirely clear on what Mothman is, to be honest we'll, with you. We'll come back to it. Is it okay. Uh, Ring- so, uh, un- unconfirmed. R- Ring- <laughs> Wow, you added a new one. <laughs> this is like play, this is like playing with a very intelligent robot. Uh, reincarnation. Uh, uh, I mean, mm, no, but like this is this is interesting because no, but I'm just okay. I know it's but it's Allison. But it's, I got okay. I'm going to treat you this way. I treat every guest in this game. Is bullshit or believe it? Well, but what I'm saying is if we counted reincarnation as like being able to load our intelligence up into another being, does that count as reincarnation? In which case, believe it, because I do believe you could sort of download your brain. If that counts as reincarnation, sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. That's really funny you mentioned that because the next one on the list is downloading your brain into a computer. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, believe it. ESP. Uh, Bullshit. Haunted houses. 
Um, mm. I mean, I know I just said I don't believe in ghosts, but I do believe in creepy feelings <laughs> around houses. The Illuminati. Uh, uh, I mean, that they do anything? Or just that, that there's a... Allison, there's like, Allison Pill? It's sorry, I'm just, again, this is a bit of a we'll mock man. I haven't read up on a loop. Okay, okay, unconfirmed. unconfirmed. Uh, there's, a fa- <laughs> there's a face on Mars. Uh, no, there's not. <laughs> Skunk Ape. <laughs> Skunk Ape, I have a hat for Skunk Ape. No way. Uh, and yet, yeah, I do. Uh, from the Tamiami Trail in Florida. Um, love Skunk Ape, but it's not real. Bullshit. Wow. Heaven. Heaven, 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 heaven. Uh, n- no, but no, because you're not saying afterlife. No. Okay, okay. bullshit. Thank you. Hell. Uh, bullshit. Sea serpents. What do you... What do you mean? Whatever it means to you. I mean, do you mean secret ones that we don't know about? Maybe. That like live in the Mariana Trench? Yeah, sure. Or like, um, sure, some unknown further further sea creature. Sure, yes, believe it. Nice. (laughs) Poltergeists. Uh, How are they different from ghosts? They move things around. They're sometimes disembodied voices. They throw shit around your apartment. They're not necessarily like full form manis- manifestations. So, okay, also, okay. they might be telekinetic uh, powers of girls going through puberty, but that's that's a weird. Explanation. <laughs> that's that's a whole other episode. <laughs> that's right. So that's like Carrie shit. Yeah. Okay, so Carrie's right. a poltergeist. Her powers are are poltergeisty. Yes, the telekinesis okay. is. But but I mean, if if Carrie was doing this and no one could see Carrie, they might say, "Oh, a poltergeist is here." Right, but it's yeah. just her and her yeah. pubescent female rage. Yes. Do I believe in pubescent female rage? Sure. Believe it. Okay, chupacabra. <laughs> Can't promise we'll add that to the list, but <laughs> <laughs> good to have your opinion. Um, <laughs> who is chupacabra? <laughs> <laughs> Atlantis. Uh, um, who is Chupacabra? <laughs> <laughs> That's a t-shirt. That's yeah. a t-shirt. <laughs> who is Chupacabra? Uh, Atlantis. Um, sure, believe it. Life on other planets. Believe it. Parallel dimensions. Believe it. The apocalypse. Uh, okay, sorry. I'm just reading Revelation right now with my Bible study group. Fantastic. Um, sorry, we should have said that right off the bat because there's a lot to unpack. Um, the apocalypse, <laughs> like, um, w- like the apocalypse, bibl- biblical apocalypse or apocalyptic thinking, because there's a lot of Jewish apocalyptic thinking mm. that goes. It's actually just history telling. Yeah. We're talking about apocalypse as an end of the world. Yeah, the what end of the world. About? Whatever, whatever you sure, think. Sure. I mean, when the earth the will eventually be subsumed by the sun. Great. So, sure. Believe, believe it. it. And finally, <laughs> life after death. Well, considering we can just upload our consci- consciousnesses and also that if God is in some way infinity or some giant consciousness, then sure, there's life after death. Fantastic. Well done, Allison Pill. I must say that was one of my favorite rounds of this game ever. Well played. Well um, played. To Allison. answer a couple questions, Chupacabra is a goat sucker. They extinguish you livestock. It's so, like a goat sucking alien. And you know, you know how you read about all those stories. Well, maybe you don't read about all those stories about chickens being uh oh boy. Here goes, of blood. Here goes and- Bryce talking about animal mutilations with and nitrogen. cows that have like, you know, been, you yeah. know. It's like think of it like a vampire goat, you know, that goes around and uh, not a goat, but a vampire. Okay, goat. that's where I, so it's not. It's not yeah. a goat, but it's is a it little like vampire a demon? creature? Some people think it's an alien, and then some people think it's like a canine. A lot of people think that they're just attributed to sites of coyotes with mange. Right. There's but a couple in, versions. But in Puerto Rico in the '90s, when it was first seen, it looked sort of like a reptilian alien with fangs that would uh people would see like leaping over their fences and right it, after and, the movie species was released there yeah. <laughs> so uh it's a wild one it's it a, is wild a wild one. one the mothman's an interdimensional entity that's a harbinger of doom wait what yeah you should read you know what you should read you'd really like it you got to read the mothman prophecies by john keel 
you'll totally dig that book. It's all about this guy doing a paranormal investigations in the 1960s in the Ohio River Valley. So there's all these weird, weird stories. But it's, it's like really a winged awesome. moth with glowy red eyes and large quads that goes around. Uh, yeah, he's got that, sick calves. He's got <laughs> sick calves. Do you know that the one, I mean, the one uh, creature that, I I'm fine with snakes, spiders, etc. I mean, I wouldn't choose um, to, you know, I, I don't mind them. I'm not, I'm not like phobic, but moths, moths. Oh, are wow. My they're very, they're very not good. Mm-mm. Well, you might want to read this book. You would not want or to read not. the moth man. During yeah. the day. <laughs> yeah, don't read it. I don't know if I can handle it. Might be a little scary. All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it's time for this week's story of high strangeness with Allison Pill. Yay all right here we go everyone it's time for this week's story of high strangeness it's bryce's turn bryce what did you bring in for the class today well i think you're gonna love it i think it fits in so much with what we've been talking about so i i I hope you'll enjoy this story famed ufologist jacques Vallée often stated that while most people are caught up in the trap of trying to figure out who was flying the UFOs and where did they come from, a better question to ask might be, what effect are these contacts and sightings having on us psychologically and culturally? What is their influence on us? Why are we seeing these things? Bryce, are you basically doing our book club review for the Patreon as a... No, as no. High strangeness? Okay, good. No, this is, I got no. a little nervous. No, no. You have nothing to be nervous about. You know, I was in my car the other day flipping through things to listen to on YouTube when I found a video um, entitled Joe Rogan's Most Heated Debates. And I thought, oh, oh this, you know, this could be interesting. <laughs> I Let thought me- you said I wasn't supposed to get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give this a try. And in one segment in particular, Joe Rogan was pressing his guest on his Catholicism and arguing about how the whole God and religion thing was just silly superstition and fairy tales, and more to the point, that we don't need it, any, we don't need it anymore. To which I remember thinking, you know, that's kind of a crass and mundane way to sum up thousands of years of human history. And then I thought, I know where I've heard that before. I get the same response whenever I talk about Bigfoot or Mothman or aliens and fairies with my family and friends. I hear the same response. Oh, Bryce, those are just completely fabricated stories and silly superstition. He's but talking you know, into a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I don't believe that. And while I don't look at every story from the Bible or the Quran or the Vedas or even the Book of Mormon for that matter and say, all these things literally happened, I do contend that something happened something more than just parable and allegory. And more to Valet's earlier point, these stories from our past that contain supernatural elements have had a tremendous impact on us as a species, whether we believe them or not. Which brings me to my next story of high strangeness that may help illustrate my point. A story in which something incredible happened, something miraculous. And although it may contain some religious motifs, it also holds a lot of parallels to fairy as well as alien lore. Either way, It altered the lives of millions of people. On the early morning hours of Saturday, December 9th, 1531 in Mexico, a 57-year-old Aztec Indian whose Nahuatl name was Singing Eagle and whose Spanish name was Juan Diego was going to church near Mexico City when suddenly he began hearing a concert of singing birds, which was strange because the air was so bitterly cold that no bird in their right mind would be singing at that hour. Then from seemingly out of nowhere, Juan heard a woman's voice calling his name from the top of a hill that was covered in a frosty and glowing mist. And when he climbed up the hill, that's when he saw her, a beautiful young Mexican girl about 14 years old with golden beams surrounding her from her head to her feet. She told Juan in his native Aztec language that her name was Mary and that she desired a temple to be built on that very spot. And she told Juan to Run down to Mexico City and tell the Lord Bishop all that you have seen and heard. So, of course, Juan does as he's told, and he runs to the Lord Bishop's palace, where he was greeted by Don Fray Juan de Zumaraga, Zumaraga to hear his story. Naturally, the bishop did not believe a word of it and sent Juan on his way. So Juan went back the way he came, where he was greeted by this strange apparition once again. And Juan basically told her that she should probably send someone more suitable to the task, someone the bishop would believe. To which Mary replied, Listen, little son, there are many that I could send, but you are the one I have chosen for this task. So tomorrow morning, go back to the bishop 
and tell him that it is the Virgin Mary who sends you, and repeat to him my great desire for a church in this place. The next morning, Juan heads back to the city to meet with the bishop for a second time. This time, Juan Diego was so adamant and seemed so honest in telling of his encounter that Bishop Frey was somewhat shaken. Imagine his position for a second. You're a Catholic bishop and someone tells you the Virgin Mary has appeared to one of your flock and has a message for you. Do you listen or do you hang up the phone? So to be utterly sure, he told Juan to ask the apparition for a tangible sign, some proof of her existence. And just to be sure there was no funny business, he had Juan followed by two of his men. They followed him through the city and saw that he spoke to no one but went directly to the hill. They watched as he climbed the hill and then vanished into thin air, gone. Not believing their own eyes, they searched the entire area but found not a single trace. But Juan did meet with Mary on the hilltop that afternoon, and when he told her that the bishop wanted proof, she replied, Very well, little son. Come back tomorrow at daybreak. I will give you a sign for him. You have taken much trouble on my account, and I shall reward you for it. Go in peace and rest. However, that next morning, Juan's uncle, his only relative, fell deathly ill, and Juan spent the entire day trying to ease his suffering. The following day, Juan ran to the city to get a priest for his dying uncle, but was once again stopped by the ghostly apparition of this 14-year-old little Mexican girl claiming to be the Virgin Mary. Embarrassed about missing his appointment with her previous day, Juan explained to her about how his only relative was dying. She said, My little son, do not be distressed and afraid. I'm not here who am your mother. Am I not here who am your mother? Are you not under my shadow and protection? Your uncle will not die at this time. This very moment, his health is restored. There is no reason now for the errand you set out on, and you can peacefully attend to mine. Go up to the top of that hill, cut the flowers that are growing there, and bring them to me. Now, Diego knew darn good and well there would be no flowers growing on the top of that hill in the middle of December, but who was he to question her? So off he went to the top of the hill where he found some Castilian roses, their petals wet with dew, which I might add are not native to the area. Astonished, he cut them and placed them carefully in his long Indian cape known as a tilma to protect them from the cold. He carried them back down to the apparition and she proceeded to arrange the flowers carefully on top of his tilma and then she tied the corners to keep them from falling out. She then advised him not to let anybody but the bishop see the sign she had given him and as quickly as she came, she vanished. Juan Diego would never see her again. Juan raced to the bishop's palace where he was greeted by several palace servants who began making fun of him for his proof as they pushed him around and tried to snatch the flowers. But when they reached for them, they magically dissolved and so they let him pass. Juan came upon the bishop and untied the corners of his tilma, which was basically just a crude cloth, um, and the flowers fell to the floor. So much for Mary's careful arrangement. But just as Juan thought he had botched it, the bishop rose from his chair and began kneeling in front of Juan's feet, followed by the other servants in the palace, who all dropped to their knees in humble subservience. They were all staring dumbfounded at Juan's tilma, which to his utter surprise, held a beautiful radiant image of Mary, the Blessed Virgin. As author Ethel Cook Elliott remarks, millions of people have knelt before it ever since where it has been placed over the high altar in the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Mexico City. The tilma consists of two pieces of woven cactus fiber sewn together, measuring 66 by 41 inches, and on the unbleached linen, a lovely figure can be seen 56 inches tall. In the six years that followed the incident, over 8 million Indians were baptized, and even today, some 1,500 people kneel before Juan's tilma every day. The tilma, unbelievably, is still intact with bright, radiant colors. Oh, and as for Juan's uncle, he was cured the day he was waiting for a priest to offer him his last rites. He saw in his room suddenly fill with a soft light while a luminous figure of a young woman appeared near him. She told him that he would be healed and informed him of his nephew's mission. She also said, Call me and my, call my image Santa Maria de Guadalupe. Ethel Cook Elliott makes the observation that in the native Aztec language that the apparition spoke to Juan, the Guadalupe could actually be the Aztec word, um, which I'm about to say off, Tetclatzo, whatever, which could be translated into Stone Serpent Trodden On, and helps us to assume that the apparition was announcing the end of the worship of Quetzalcoatl, 
whom the Indians had idolized as the feathered Guana. serpent. But Socorro, that's right. So in Valet's seminal work, Passport to Magonia, Jacques is quick to point out the similarities of this story to the many important aspects of fairy accounts passed down. For instance, the mysterious sweet music with a choir of birds announcing that the fairy draws near, the flowers that grow in impossible places, and the sign given to the messenger that changes as it goes away, like the coals given to midwives by the gnomes that then changed into gold. And finally, the cosmic symbolism, the crescent moon under the Virgin's feet is in the lines of the book of Revelations, which Allison, you said you were studying, which I thought was synchronistic. And there appeared a great sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon was under her feet, and upon in a head of crown of twelve stars. Strangely enough, describing the radiant image on Juan's tilma almost perfectly. And that's the story of the Lady of Guadalupe. And I guess it, you know, brings up the question that so often we've talked about, you know, is there a separate agency between religious apparitions, fairy visions, or entity contact? Are these things all separate phenomena, or could they somehow be related? What do you think, Allison? Um, I, I think they're related. I mean, I think Christian colonial thought, Roman thought, whoever the invaders have been have sort of mastered whatever local lore needs to be discarded or incorporated it. I mean, we have Christmas trees in our houses. Yeah. <laughs> like there's nothing more pagan than that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, if you guys are next to a search engine, just type in um our lady. I was trying to Guadalupe. share screen to show you guys, but um and it's an incredible image. And it, it's it's taken on simple cactus fiber, which should have eroded after about 30 to 50 years. This thing is still intact and still in radiant form. As a matter of fact, uh some scientists have even been baffled by it. Um there is a guy, uh, let's see here, Ta- a, a doctor um, by the name of Tonsman said he believes the, uh, wait, where am I here? Hold on. Um, a miraculous painting or a heavenly photograph. In 1979, when working with digitized high resolution images of the, of the Tilma, magnified 2,500 times, Dr. Jose Tonsman discovered that human figures were reflected in the Virgin's eyes, a total of 13 people the same people who were present in both the left and the right eyes in different proportions, as would happen when human eyes reflect the objects before them. Tonsman said he believes the reflections transmitted by the eyes of the Virgin of Guadalupe is the actual scene that took place when Juan Diego showed his tilma with the image to Bishop Juan de Zumarraga and others present in the room. In fact, nuclear physicist Dr. Charles Wallig also posited that the Blessed Mother must have been invisibly present when Juan Diego was presenting the roses and that the tilma acted like a photographic plate that captured her image and the reflection of their images in her eyes. And that's just one of the other few things, too. There was a bomb that went off um, in, uh, in the 1700s. Somebody brought in a, a bouquet of roses, and a bomb was placed, and they put it right under the altar. The, it, I mean, practically, the whole altar was it destroyed, including... Um, you know, metal was bent. The glass was broken where the tilma is, and it was completely untouched. Um, so, so there's a lot of strange things. So the, the, the constellations in the picture are actually um, accurate to the time of, the, of this reported sighting. And uh, the stars are astronomically correct precisely to the constellations of the winter sky on December 12th. And incredibly, the constellations are shown as viewed from outside the heavens. In other words, in reverse – as if it were a picture from someone looking at it from the outside the universe in a snapshot of the heaven and the earth from that very moment. Um, Richard Kuhn, the 1938 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, found that the image did not have natural animal or mineral colorings. Given that there were no synthetic colorings in 1531, the image is inexplicable. And uh, there's like seven more crazy things about this tilma that, that, that science can't explain, that, which really begs the question, you know, what took place on that hill? And uh, obviously it had a huge effect on, uh, on the Indian society, the Mexican society. So, um, yeah, there's obviously, and this is to his point, right? There's some sort of agency that is swaying culture that is, that is you know, has influence over us. And uh, some call it God, some call it fairies. Some I wonder. It- I wonder if it's like, 
I don't know. I'm torn with this story because part of me feels like this is just like really good PR to get people to come to this church. Yeah. You know, it's just like good lore. Right. You know, because that, you know, uh, I get it. It's just like it's really it's just like we got to keep keep this is what, what do they call those relics? Like every church, Catholic church has like different relics that are like this is why I got to come to this one. So they're just like doing a really good job of selling that legend and selling that s- story. So, yeah. I'm t- I've got that in my head, but especially since this is like the, you know, you know, 16th century. But I wonder if there's some type of, I'm going to go in the opposite direction here of like entity or like natural spirit that lives in that part of, of the world up on that hillside. And in order for it to communicate with this boy, it's kind of what Allison was saying a little bit earlier. The spirit itself is saying, let me, oh, dogs are welcome here. It's all good. Don't, do not worry. <laughs> we, we enjoy all pets here, Allison. But like, what if it's some kind of like, into, into, oh my goodness, oh. some intelligence where it's taking on the form of, okay, I'll appear to this person as the Virgin Mary because that's the way they'll understand. That's the story they will understand as I try to communicate with mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously it's pushing people away from the worship of, of those old pagan deities. And for the Mexican and the Aztecs, the, uh, the feathered serpent Quetzalcoatl, it's moving them in a different direction saying, let's start worshiping this now. Let's move in the, let's move in this direction. Yeah. Everyone look over here. Yeah. I don't know. It's strange. I mean, you know, I don't know. That's why you just can't discount all those stories in the, in the, in the, in the Bible and in the Quran and all that stuff. It just, you know, I don't know. Something happened. It just seems a little too convenient to the message they're selling. That's like whenever someone's sort of selling something with these sort of miraculous apparitions, I'm like, eh. yeah, it kind of like what good timing that she yeah. told you to stamp out your God. Right. Yeah. But, <laughs> but listen, I mean, to build a church, this, this simple fabric cloth has been held under scientific scrutiny uh, for the latter part of 500 years. And it has, so baffled, they say it has baffled. Yes. Yeah, so they say, but it has baffled many a scientists and, and the more instruments they use to evaluate this thing, the more perplexed they become, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, there was the guy who used infrared on it. Uh, where is that thing? How can you a paint, it looks like how a can, single brush stroke? How can a cloth painting last almost 500 years? Infrared studies also revealed other unexplainable phenomena. The image was not painted, and the color did not penetrate the fibers as would paint. Weaving with such irregular fibers also produced a rough surface, which would have distorted any simple surface painting, yet the image one sees is clear and undistorted. Um, I mean, so this is a 500-year-old cactus fiber cloth. I mean, obviously, they've done a, a good job at trying to preserve it, but but it does beg some questions. But I also wonder why would she look like that? You, you know, that's a great question. <laughs> obviously, you know, in the in the story of the Bible, the Virgin Mary is not a little Aztec Indian girl. So um, why should she be in Mexico City? Um, obviously, you know, the human consciousness of Juan Diego, that's how he perceived it. And that's how she wanted to be represented to the bishop, yeah. which then, uh, converted almost 8 million followers, uh, within those following years. So I don't know. So it, it's, uh, it's a powerful image. We've seen it before. Like, uh, the, 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 the children of Fatima who saw the, the Virgin Mary, she seems to be, um, such a powerful symbolic archetype that can really you know transform a a person or a people's consciousness just as powerful as as jesus you know i mean that is really interesting like that's an image that obviously like we've all seen forever i've never heard that story i didn't know that backstory on it but of course familiar with the image um yeah are you seeing the image on the on your computer yeah i'm looking pretty wild isn't it i mean yeah although I also found an article from 1999 of the one. And that's of, all the time we have for the show now. <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. One of the, uh, the people that watched over it for 30 years wrote a letter to the Pope saying to not make uh, Juan Diego a saint because it, it's all made up and that it was basically just a PR move for the church. Interesting. So there, yeah, he's the guy that's that's going. Hey, who brought Neil deGrasse Tyson in here? <laughs> Jeez, buzzkill. <laughs> also, the site. Go, going back into the adopting of paganism, the site where this is supposed to have taken place was a site where an Aztec goddess had been worshipped in the past. 
yeah. that's interesting like, appropriation there which is interesting yeah um yeah and apparently there's no hard evidence that juan diego even ever existed that's mm. what i was wondering too well also art historians are saying that the skin color has become progressively darker over the years so it's been touched up interesting uh, allison final th- final thoughts allison um i mean i just uh, i really struggle with uh, yeah. I, I struggle with mary generally just in terms of the necessity of the virgin birth to tie jesus to god specifically um just a really weird story as a woman you're like Mm. Was that consensual? Why her? All of those questions. Like, there's a lot of questions. Um, and making sense of things that way. I just am sort of like, why would she? You're just saying she's as powerful as Jesus. I'm like, well, we have Jesus's words. Like, we have his speeches and sermons as well as we know. I mean, we do think that there was like a rabbi named Jesus. As for Mary, we know so little about her. Um, that it, it, I think the, the stories put on her and the lack of her own volition throughout the stories on her have always been sort of, have made me sad. Mm. Um, and so in terms of the connection where I'm just like, I hope she wouldn't just kind of show up and be like, look, I look just like you too. And you're like, when you, and I'm the 16th century lady. Like, why? Why wouldn't you just show up as you and just be like, hey, man. You like hot 14-year-old girls, don't you? (laughs) This isn't all creepy. (laughs) Oh, boy. It's just one of those things where I just, I try not to, it's just one of, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem with myths around women. I mean, there's problems with myths around men, too. But myths around women specifically make me cringe. Yeah. tend to make me cringe more. Sure. Well, sorry, sorry, Allison, sorry. No. <laughs> no, we value your opinion. And, you know, I, this is. Yeah, this is exactly why we need you on the show. I think that to me, if you don't take it literally, the, the image of, of Mary is really about the sacred feminine, feminine, femininity and just being able to appreciate like this. The, 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 the women are literally the gateway to life. Like they're the ones who are bringing life into this world. And I think that for me, Mary ultimately represents that just as an, as the iconography. I mean, and sometimes, sometimes the way she's even drawn with the hood and the cloak and everything, even she kind of looks like a vagina. Yeah. And uh-huh. so I think you're really, when we're, I thought really, you were about to say she looks like she's Illuminati. Yes, yeah, looks like she's the, in the Illuminati. But I, I, I think really that's what it's about, you know, to me. It's just sort of being like, hey, we should really be worshiping and appreciating the force of life that women are and the fact that they bring us into this world, you know? Sure. And that's, Listen, that's, if, if, there's, if, if there's energies in this universe that are polarized, let's call them black, white, masculine, feminine, whatever, they're going to need representations or, archety- or, or archetypes to funnel that energy through. And so often we see that what you were talking about, Michael, that feminine energy represented through this powerful image of, uh, of Jesus's mother who gave birth to the you know, to the, to the miracle child. So that's just one way of sort of pushing that energy out onto us as a society through that, uh, through that representation of Mary, you know, it's powerful. Would you, would you interpret the Mary that he met as just, he met the divine feminine on a hill one day? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I think you put that well and succinctly. I think that's exactly what took place. These energies need a way to manifest themselves and and so often they anthropomorphize them through through images that are sort of in our lexicon and and Mary's always been there and and that's a great way uh for it to have the most impact on on us as a species and how to get a church built pretty quick <laughs> 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 All right. Well, Allison, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been an awesome conversation. And yeah. uh, we ask our guests, like Bigfoot, where can people find you? Where, if, what's your social media? What, what are you working oh, on? Oh, God. I'm like in well, You always have to explain it. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a perfect. We don't do that. Yeah. All right. Fine. It's done. So reti- officially retired, everyone. Oh, no. I, I, um, I'm done. on Instagram. Is that what you mean? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm on Instagram. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you can well, find me on Instagram. We'll tag you. We'll tag you in, in this week's episode so people can go over there and follow you. And definitely, if, uh, I, I, say, I can't say this enough. If you haven't seen Devs, uh, find a way to watch it and watch it. It's great. Allison, great. you're so good in it. You're so good in everything that you do. Um, and then, of course, we got to check out Picard. And anything coming up this summer that, that you might be in? Well, I shot something that was, I think, four days away from completion. That's a horror show about... Uh, I mean, it's a horror show because it's about race in America in the 1950s. <gasps> oh, but it is literally horror. I auditioned for this and I did not get cast. But I, it's a, I read the pilot and it's fantastic. Um, so it's, and I don't know when that'll, you know, we were days away from sort of finishing. So I don't know when now that'll be there. But it'll be there. What's the name of that again? Them. Them. That's right. Awesome. Man, that was good script. Okay, awesome. Uh, you guys can help us out by going to Apple Podcasts and giving us a five star review, like the one that Libra Heart ninety one just wrote us. Bigfoot would approve. Bigfoot would approve of this podcast. One of my favorite paranormal podcasts. Easy to get into and feels like hanging out with friends. Love BCC news and hearing the guests' spooky stories. Plus. Bryce, Michael, and Riley are all hilarious. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, give us a plug. It really helps us get the show to more people. You can follow me at McMills on all the social media, Bigfoot Collectors Club on Instagram, and Bigfoot Pod on Twitter. Until next week, I remain Michael McMillan for... Oh, wait. Bryce Johnson, Bryce O. Johnson on Twitter, and Peace Drone on Instagram for Riley. That's right. And uh, are you... Why well, tag you as Riley Bray and everything on Twitter? Are you ever on Twitter? It's a pretty I picture. I made one, like, 10 years ago and then never used it. Well, we, we tag you in it anyway. Okay. No, I had no uh, idea. Yeah. <laughs> Until Perfect. next time, I'm Michael McMillan, Bryce Johnson, Riley Bray. Good night and go get regress. All right. <laughs>